Okay, well, yeah. uh, good evening, everyone. I first wanna say thank you, Historic Districts Council, for inviting me and always including me in your adventures in the Bronx. I always appreciate and I applaud your work uh, here in the borough. As you know, there are a lot of sections in the Bronx that have uh, these historic districts and uh, we need some more um, highlighting. And, uh, and I think you guys are doing a good job. Also, I wanna congratulate you guys, uh, 50th anniversary. Um, I'm hoping you, uh, you can endure many, many more years because there's gonna be a lot more work uh, as we, we do more research on, on these historic buildings in the Bronx. So I, I'm not gonna take much time, but I just wanted to shed a little historic context of uh, the, the section we call Longwood uh, in the Bronx. A lot of people think that uh, it's part of Hunts Point or it's part of Morrisania, but it's smack, back, it's smack in the middle of these two neighborhoods. And uh, the reason why I, I start this uh, presentation with this map is because uh, the place and the section we now call Longwood uh, historically for many years was called the Debatable Lands. And um, if you look down in the South Bronx to the Southwest, you'll see it says Bronx 1641. But by the 1670s uh, and onward, that later became Morrisania. Uh, the Morris family owned pretty much most of the South Bronx. However, they just couldn't own anything beyond uh, uh, the Bound Brook, uh, what they would call the Bungay, bro uh, Bungay Brook. Uh, they always thought, and you can switch to the next, I'll say next, and you'll go to the next slide. So this person here, this is Colonel Lewis Morris. He was the first manor, uh, uh, he was the first Lord of the Manor of Morrisania. And this was the guy who expanded the estate and he was constantly fighting uh, with the village of Westchester because of these debatable lands. Uh, he always thought that uh, the Morrisania uh, ancestral lands extended over to the Sacrahung River uh, however, uh, those in Westchester would, would kind of argue and say, no, you know, this is part of Westchester. And uh, they actually thought that the Bound, uh, the Bound Brook uh, would, be the better, would be the better land designation. Well, that river that we are speaking of today is still running in, under Intervale Avenue. If you, look at, if you look at the name Intervale, it describes the land feature and how it looked. Uh, when that part of the Bronx was settled. And uh, 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 the Sacrahung actually ran through uh, the interval, what it is today, and it emptied out an Indian pond. Now, there is a lot of confusion about this. You could go to the next slide. We're actually looking at 1868 Longwood, the section of Longwood, and kind of visualizing what I'm saying here. Look at all these creeks, right? So landowners always had this conflict, whether, whether one creek is marking the bounds of their land or, or, or another. So this was called the debatable lands. This went on for a hundred more years, even Governor Morris went to war with the Leggett family. You can see Leggett's Creek there, uh, uh, later on to be called Bound Creek. And uh, this was a, a hotly debated piece of land in the Bronx. So if you ever go down or go up to a Cortona Park Indian Pond, that was the source of this bound brook that runs right in the middle of this photo and ends up as Leggett's Creek. So you notice that uh, there are some uh, estates here and there are some names that uh, you recognize today. Uh, Casanova Street in Hunts Point, you see Castello de Casanova, Renacqua or Renac, that was the, the indigenous name of this part of the Bronx, uh, labeled by the, uh, the Siwanoi, uh, Lenape language. And um, so it just gives you an idea of this part of the Bronx and how it, was, how it was used as playground for these huge families that wanted these summer estates or, or these holiday estates north of Manhattan. But what I wanna talk to you about is uh, first, you could go on to the next uh, slide. So during the 19th century, this part of the Bronx, Longwood, debatable lands that I would jokingly call it, you had these beautiful mansions just sprawled throughout the landscape. And one of them was Castello de Casanova. Now, I wanna take a quick guess here. This is a second empire. Anybody, uh, architectural uh, uh, you know, experts here? Is this a second empire uh, 
sort of architecture here? Correct me, wrong? Quiz? Come on, Tom. Hey, you agreed. Okay, so yeah, so this is a Second Empire uh, style of mansion. Now, uh, it was originally owned by a person named Benjamin Whitlock. Benjamin Whitlock was in the mercantile business. Uh, and up until the Civil War, uh, you know, he was making a lot of money. He was a prosperous uh, 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 merchant. He had shops in downtown. And uh, it was a time when New York uh, was very tied into the textile industry in the South. And there was even talks of seceding uh, during the Civil War. So Benjamin Whitlock in 1861 took it upon himself and invited a small regiment of Confederate soldiers to his house here in the Bronx and sort of try to end the Civil War there. Unfortunately, that did not happen. After the Civil War, Benjamin Whitlock went bankrupt. He lost his, uh, all his fortunes. And uh, a person, a Cuban gentleman named uh, uh, Inocencio Casanova y Fagundo, uh, brought the house after the Civil War in 1866, 1867, and uh, supposedly it was used as some type of headquarters uh, for Cuban revolutionaries. His daughter was Amelia Casanova, and uh, she was uh, 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 one of the very first, well, the first woman uh, at the White House and to address Congress about Spanish dominance in the Caribbean. Uh, she was a president of Liga de, uh, La, Hijas, La Liga de Hijas de Cuba, and uh, she was a revolutionary, and she also had her operations here as well. This house no longer sits, uh, it's no, no longer standing. Uh, it's now torn down, but we have a Casanova uh, street as a reminder. Next. <clears throat> so I wanna point out this mansion here. Uh, this is the old, uh, well, our, us Bronx historians will call it the old SB White House but it was actually built by Charles Dennison. Uh, Charles Dennison was also a, a, a prosperous uh, a merchant, lower Manhattan, he had a lot of businesses, and uh, he was also into politics. And I'll tell you what, uh, he was a representative from Pennsylvania and a Democrat elected to the 38th, 39th, and 40th Congress. Well, uh, S.B. White, Samuel White was his son-in-law. And it was how S.B. White came into uh, possession in this house, uh, to this house in 1865. So it, it was a time when this part of the Bronx, you still had mansions. Uh, it was nothing like what we would see today. Uh, you still had your landscape, uh, natural landscapes. And uh, this is the only thing that sat uh, in the area. You could go on to the next. And we'll, we're going to talk more about S.B. White House because it played an important role in uh, the historic districts that still remain today in Longwood. So here's just the rear. Uh, we're looking at Leggett Avenue, right? Um, but this was the rear of the S.B. White House. And just giving you an idea of the land formation here. This is near uh, Southern Boulevard. Uh, Southern Boulevard was, uh, it, it's, it's one of the oldest uh, major thoroughfares in the Bronx. Southern Boulevard was laid out in relation with Eastern Boulevard in the 1870s. Uh, Southern Boulevard brought you from the South Bronx and it took you all the way from the South to connect you to the East, uh, Eastern Boulevard. And then Eastern Boulevard will bring you out to, to the Eastern part of the Bronx. Well, we still have Southern Boulevard today, but no longer Eastern Boulevard. Today is Bruckner Boulevard. So just give me an idea of the land feature uh, here. Now, if you notice, it was very rocky in this part of the Bronx. Well, when, uh, when George Johnson uh, developed uh, this part of the Bronx, when he brought the SB White House and developed this part of Longwood, a lot of this had very strong and prominent stone uh, rock foundations. So many of the houses that are still standing today that are designated in the historic district are on rock of solid rock foundations. So that was one of the uh, interesting characteristics when uh, uh, the houses that we see today were laid out at the turn of the 20th century. Next. So uh, by the turn of the 20th century, uh, as I mentioned before, George Johnson uh, was a prominent uh, developer. And, uh, and, and by 1880, uh, uh, the land, uh, S.B. White House, was 
not used anymore. Uh, the land was being developed. And so George Johnson decided to buy this original estate and develop it. And this is what we see today as the historic district. But I want to give you an idea of uh, the turn of the century. Uh, this is 1903 when Longwood Avenue was being laid out. Now, the name Longwood, uh, it, it has a strong English connotation. Uh, it was named after Longwood Park on the island of St. Helena, where Napoleon was, uh, was exiled and, he, and later died. So uh, in the English period of the Bronx, uh, these designations, uh, uh, names were very popular. And uh, this is how we got the name Longwood, uh, which was attached by Charles Dennison, who was the original owner of this estate. Next. Here's another snapshot looking south from Dawson Avenue, uh, uh, south on Longwood. If you look closely to your left, you're gonna see a corner of a, a building there. That is PS39. Uh, so this photo was taken like around 1904, 1905. And uh, PS39, now I'm not sure if this is a CBJ Snyder school, I do remember being on a walking tour with Gene Arrington, who's an expert in these schools. And uh, I, I vaguely remember her pointing this out. Tom, do you remember if this was a CBJ Snyder? I'm looking it up as you speak. Right? So I think it is. CBJ Snyder was an in-house architect for the Department of Education of New York. And you probably recognize some of his most famous works, like Morris High School, that's still today, uh, still on, uh, up today and also PS27, right across the street from Sayberry's Park. I believe he was designing schools from 1891 to, to the 1920s. Today, this school, and you could go on to the next slide. It's still there, it's still on the corner. And today, uh, it's, it's always PS39, but it's now Banana Kelly High School. And there's also some uh, uh, smaller educational institutions there today. So just giving you an idea of how things have changed, you know, even though New York City at the turn of the century in the Bronx, we're already seeing these tenement buildings going up, but, you know, not as much as we see today. So it takes on a different life as we see it in the present time, but you still have these architectural gems still standing, especially that PS39 all the way on the left. 1906 by Snyder. Yes. That's why, that's good, Tom. I like when you fact check me when I need it. Anyway, so what you're looking at is uh, Dawson Street, looking at Intervale Avenue. And this is, uh, this is 1905, this is actually 1909, 1910. Uh, now you probably won't recognize a lot here because on your left is now Rainy Park. So it's a huge park right in the middle of the Longwood uh, neighborhood. But it just gives you an idea of the abundance of tenement buildings that were standing at the time, even up until the 1950s and 60s, when the Bronx uh, started uh, experiencing some, some uh, urban decay and some economic uh, uh, misfortunes, which is, uh, by the way, I don't have enough time today, but uh, later on when you learn about Longwood uh, and the history of Longwood, uh, you would learn that it's also the birthplace, birthplace of Bronx activism. Uh, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, you had uh, grassroots organizations uh, developing here, like Banana Kelly, uh, named after the, the, the Kelly Street uh, curvature of a banana, right? This is where Colin Powell lived. Uh, you had Sebco, uh, Father Gigante, who, who was involved in the uh, rehabilitation of tenement buildings there in the 70s. United Bronx Parents, uh, founded by Dr. Uh, uh, Evelina Antonetti. So this is more of a contemporary history, but it's still very rich. And, uh, and it all plays to what the Bronx is going through today. So I encourage you uh, to study more of, of Longwood's history because that's where you get a, a lot of the grassroots information from. Next. That's how it looks today. That's Rainy Park on the left. And uh, you can see some, some newer structures on the right, but just giving you an example of how much the, the neighborhood has changed. Uh, growing up as a kid, you know, I, I graduated from South Bronx High School. And even in the 80s and 90s, this didn't look that way. You know, it, it was, there, there was some problems happening in the community. So 
it, it looks a lot better. It just gives you an example of the major changes and developments and also the improvements uh, made by citizens themselves. Uh, read more about Banana Kelly. Uh, they started off as a sweat equity organization moving into or living in abandoned apartments that were left by landlords and they were making their own repairs. So there's a fascinating history here in Longwood, especially in urban uh, re redevelopment. Next. Here's another site uh, you're probably familiar with. This is the corner of Southern Boulevard and Longwood. And that is the corner, uh, that is the number six train on the corner. Right across the street, this was taken like around 1909, 1910, right? Uh, the building across the street where you see that nice little Model T right in front, uh, that used to be a garage for trolley cars, right? Uh, and I believe that was called the Metro Company, uh, I believe, something like that. Uh, later on, and uh, Elena, I, I know you're on the call, was this the location of the Tropicoro uh, Club? Um, yeah, the, tro well, the Tropicoro, is that where the police station is now? Yes, yes. So yeah, so that, that's the 61st now, right? So then it would be, um, yeah, the Tropicoro it's, it's, was there. Yeah, it's the 41st. Did they use okay. the same building? I don't think so, but I don't really know. I'd have to yeah. look into the history of that, of the precinct there, yeah. Yeah, I, I was hoping he was on the call because I, I was trying to, I, I'd never seen a photo of the Tropicoro but I knew that it was at the location of where the 41st Precinct sits today. So uh, that is now Southern Boulevard. Beyond the building where the Model T is at, that is now where the Bruckner Expressway runs. So just giving you an idea, once again, how much this, this neighborhood has changed, but at the same time, not too much, because if we switch to the next slide, you still have your tenement building there, right? It's, 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 it's one of those uh, staple buildings on the corner for some reason. Corner buildings last more than, than, than the inner block buildings, right? But you still have your train station there and you still have your, your storefront uh, establishments. So although uh, there are some landscaping that changed, you still have some newer, uh, some older buildings that remain after so many years. So just giving you a contrast of how you know, the transformation of uh, uh, the neighborhood of Longwood throughout the years. Next. So going back uh, to the SB White House, and there's a major reason why I wanna talk about this. What you're looking at is not the complete original structure. Uh, the development behind us, uh, this was developed by Lantern Group in association with a, a well, what I got is Lantern Group. These are the developers of the, the housing development in back of this structure, the SB White House. Now, when developers came in, uh, this is going on, what, six, seven years ago, they had to tear down most of the SB White House. Now, people in the neighborhood that, that lived in the neighborhood for so many years had memories about this SP White House because it was the first location of the PAL Center, the Pol Police Athletic League, which is now on Longwood. Now, there's a major connection here, not just with people in Longwood, but personal collection, uh, connection. My own mom, when she came from Puerto Rico in 1953, she used to come here to the PAL. My uncles used to come here, and everybody else in the neighborhood that I've come across and interviewed had some very fond memories of, of this, uh, this clubhouse, right, at the old uh, SB White House. So with people in the neighborhood coming out and defending and, you know, trying to save the legacy of the house, people at the Lantern Group decided to complete the housing development and reconstruct the SB White House. Now, this is highly symbolic because in 1883, 84, this is when George Johnson uh, brought the estate, brought the SB White House and opened it as a rental office for his future development, which is what we see today and consider as the historic district of Longwood, Beck Street, Dawson Avenue, May, uh, Macy Place. All those buildings that are still standing, designated landmarks, that was all under the development of George Johnson. And the person that uh, his one of his favorite architects was W.C. Dickerson. Uh, W.C. Dickerson, as Sam uh, Brooks knows, uh, designed uh, buildings in the Mott Haven district as well. 
So these were famous guys, uh, famous architects and designers, and it was their time to build because this was the turn of the century, the uh, transportation, the six train, the two train, elevated. This was all coming into the Bronx at the turn of the century. In the 1880s, everyone knew this, especially the land speculators. So this is why uh, George Johnson brought the house, opened it as a real estate uh, 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 location, uh, real estate office, and started the development there with uh, Dickinson as his favorite designer. Well, today, after so many years, that house, the SB house, it's, it's now called the Fox House, and it's where people still pay their rent after so many years. So there's a funny story that comes full circle uh, with the SB White House. Next. So I just want to list down uh, some of, of the houses that are designated under the, land, uh, um, under the Longwood um, Landmarks uh, destination area. What you're looking at is Dawson Street. Uh, this is East 156th Street, uh, also Thurman Munson Way, and uh, it's between Dawson and Kelly Streets. And uh, these residences are amongst the earliest Dickerson design houses in the district. Uh, now, I, I also want to throw in that Dawson is named after Henry Dawson, who, who was a, a historian, who was a local historian, and actually wrote a story about Drake Park which is still there today in Hunts Point. And if you read about it, he talks about, and this is the 1860s and 70s, he talks about how dirty Drake Park was. So just giving you an idea, you know, how Parks Department, you know, or, you know, the entity that was running parks there, they, you know, they were trying to get their stuff together. But uh, this is just an example. And what you see here is a neo-Renaissance and a mixture of uh, Romanesque revival. This is going to be throughout uh, the Landmarks District. Uh, one of the, the main features you would notice are the cones on top and the protruding bays, the, the rounded uh, protruding bays that you would see on these houses. These houses are well maintained. Um, I, I, I walk by these houses all the time. And even as a kid, you know, uh, even as I saw that there were some neighborhoods around it that were kind of sketchy, people living on these blocks, they take care of these houses very, very well. And this is why we get to enjoy them today after so many years. Next. So uh, this is 751 and 753 Beck Street. Uh, these are, they look identical, identical. There's really not much deviation from it other than, you know, uh, 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 curtains or some, uh, some other ancillary items. And I just want to read the portion of uh, the, land, uh, the Landmarks Report because it kind of captures you know, all of these features. The main entrances are framed by limestone coins and return and retain their original double wood and glass doors and transoms. Their elongated parlor floor windows are separated from transoms by narrow bands of rusticated stone, while narrow arched windows like the second story. So I encourage you to read this uh, Lance, uh, uh, this uh, landmarks report because it offers a lot of information and it also names some of these items that we're still trying to point out today, especially me as a, as, as a tour guide. You know, there's always something new to learn about architecture, and especially in, the, in these parts of the Bronx. So next. Now, uh, this is also part of Beck Street. Actually, this is, I'm sorry, this is Macy Place. And this is between Prospect Avenue and Hewlett. Now, when the first two sections, well, the original uh, set, uh, landmark designated areas of Longwood, uh, were, they were designated in 1980. Well, the houses on, Mace, on Macy Place was an extension that was done three years later in 1983. So what you're looking at is Macy Place between Prospect Avenue. Uh, it was an extension. This was 1983. And this was clearly because it was attached to the original uh, uh, preservation area. And it's a continuation of the same style of architecture, this neo-Renaissance, uh, Romanesque revival, but with some variations, right, of uh, ancillary, uh, uh, ancillary features. So uh, same color, and I was here a couple of days ago. These houses look exactly the same. 
exactly the same after so many years. So uh, Theodore Macy, in which the street was named after, was developer of this piece of Longwood. So it wasn't just George Johnson. You had other developers, uh, James Meehan, who we will talk about later on. James Meehan designed some of the first tenement buildings on Hunts Point, uh, especially the ones on 163rd Street, uh, the, the big building on the corner right across the street from the palace, Hunts Point Palace. That was a Meehan uh, project. Uh, Oneida Street, uh, Manida Street rather, uh, that was also a, a Meehan uh, development as well. So uh, there's one building that we're going to talk about where I will end this presentation, which is a Meehan uh, uh, development. But this was Theodore Macy, one of the, uh, the other developers in Longwood. Thanks. So what you're looking at is United Church Iglesia Unida, 765 Hewitt Place. Originally, it was the Montefiore Congregation Synagogue. It was built in 1906. <coughs> And it was designed by the Brooklyn architectural firm of Domar and Company. And it was built for the Montefiore Hebrew uh, Congregation in 1906. So uh, Sir Isaac Montefiore uh, was a, a prominent uh, New Yorker. He was a philanthropist. Uh, he was also a physician. And uh, he's also funded some other projects, uh, <clears throat> Montefiore Hospital. Uh, so uh, later on, it became a church. And I've done some walking tours of this neighborhood and people always ask, you know, these two onions on top, you know, is this some type of Russian congregation? I, I, I thought it would be a Russian uh, a Jewish or, or Eastern uh, a Jewish congregation. So that's the main connection I can make here. Uh, one walking tour I've con uh, conducted in this neighborhood, I, I actually brought people to the front and there was someone, uh, a, a caretaker of the church, he came out and explained that behind the wooden panels of the windows are original Tiffany stained glass. So uh, not sure, I would always like to confirm that. And one day I will get the opportunity to walk in and you know, kind of verify that myself. This is not out of the realms of uh, uh, reality because um, there are a lot of churches that are still standing that have original stained glass. So uh, this, this wouldn't be a surprise at all. Next. So what we're looking at is a snapshot of uh, 1909, 1908, 1909. And uh, we're on top of the newly, uh, well, freshly newly created elevated station on Prospect Avenue and looking south. Uh, Prospect gets its name because of its land feature. Before all these buildings were made, you had a prospective view of the East River. When Prospect Avenue was laid out, it wasn't part of any village of Morrisania or or any other village. It was part of the village of Woodstock. We had a Woodstock in the Bronx. And the only remnants we see today of that village is the Woodstock Library that still stands on 160th Street. Uh, but, but, but this was Prospect Avenue. Now, if you notice on your left, on your bottom left, see that beautiful building there? That is the Manhansen Building. And that was made by uh, James Meehan. This is the gentleman I mentioned before who was prominent in Hunts Point and on Manita Street. And uh, this was the Manhattan building. It was completed in 1906, and it's a triangular building. And the reason why I end the, the presentation here, well, we're nearing the end, because uh, this segues to our next speaker, because if you look down to the left, you're gonna see some fire escapes. If you could just pull the cursor down and then over a bit, that is where today Casa Amadeo is. Uh, uh, since 1969, but before that, it was uh, uh, Casa Antigua de, de Hernandez. And uh, it was opened by Victoria Hernandez in 1941. Uh, it was one of the earliest uh, Latino owned businesses in the Bronx. Uh, it was a music store. And at the time, music stores, they were prominent. Uh, this is where Latinos, uh, primarily Puerto Ricans, who were migrating to this part of New York and from the island, they would use these music stores uh, to congregate. So, uh, and as the story goes, and you would hear later on, uh, it still houses one of the oldest running uh, Latino owned uh, stores in the borough. Uh, another personal connection here, my family, when they came from Puerto Rico in the 50s, mid 50s, they lived at the St. Regis building, 
which is still standing on East 163rd, uh, 63rd Street and Prospect Avenue. They lived on the second floor. My grandfather owned a small little Spanish-American restaurant, which we would now call a cuchifrito. And uh, it's now where Rite Aid sits today on the corner of uh, Longwood Avenue and uh, Westchester Avenue. So my mom, when we would walk by Casa Amadeo as a kid, she would tell me, hey, I used to buy my records there. And a lot of people would go to pick up some uh, talent. You know, uh, record companies would come by and, and see who would, who would come and kind of congregate there. So uh, Casa Amadeo it continues to be a staple in the Bronx community today. And in fact, the Latino community in New York City. Um, Angel. Next Sam, slide, next slide. La Samuel, and last, we're good. Yeah, Samuel, okay, last one. Yeah, because uh, Samuel is telling me that um, Mike is closing. So. Yeah. Oh, speaking of Mike, so this is a Google view, a street view, and this is a frontal view. And if you see the gentleman on the bottom right, that's Mike Amadeo himself. So you can catch him on uh, Google Street View. And this is the Meehan building. Uh, I'm sorry, the Manhattan building as seen from Westchester Avenue. And finally, last slide. That is Casa Amadeo as we see today. And that is the owner still on uh, Street View on Google. Uh, you could catch him there making his cameo. And as you can see on the awning, just above, uh, below his, Antigua Casa Hernandez. That is the, the correct sequence there. Um, the reason why it's so landmarked with the building, because he has original items there. He has original features that date back to the time when the store opened. So without further ado, I want to turn over uh, this presentation to Mike Amadeo. It is an honor. Thank you so much for letting me open and uh, enjoy the rest of the presentation. Thanks you so know, much, Angel. You guys are going to have to give me about one more minute. He'll be with us in one minute, OK? Just give All us right. one more Yeah. If there is anything you, you miss, uh, you still have to say. Oh, man. This, I miss the American Revolution. I miss the Civil War. I missed, you know. Yeah, we, no, have, we have one, but minute, I really wanna, one minute. Yeah. Grassroots. You know, Longwood. Prospect, you know, that part of the South Bronx, you know, it was going through some major problems in the 60s and 70s. You know, in fact, almost 90% of the tenement buildings in that part of the Bronx were burnt down and abandoned. You know, it was a very, very drastic time in the Bronx. But you had these grassroots organizations arising from the dust and, and from the fires, and they, they started taking matters into their own hands. So it's a rich part of Longwood history, of Hunts Point history. And it pretty much brings context to, to, to the issues that we're dealing with today, gentrification, uh, uh, population shift, demographic, uh, demographic shift. So um, it's, it's a very fascinating story. And it's, it's something that it all plays to, it, it relates to all of us uh, who were born and raised in the Bronx. So keep talking. Is he I can. available, son? Is, is Mike available now? All right, just give me one more minute. Just keep, keep on asking Angel questions. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's live television. That's what happens, you know? <laughs> any questions? Uh... Yeah, if anyone has any questions, please type it on the chat. If you, if you have questions for Mike, please feel free to uh, type them uh, on the chat. Um, Mike is going to be with us shortly. Questions. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you yeah. a brief introduction of um, Casa Madeo and why it's so important. Um, as Angel was saying, it used to be called Casa Hernandez before it was called Casa Madeo. And Casa Hernandez started in 1941. And since 1941, uh, they've been selling Latino music. And in the 1960s, Mike took over Casa Hernandez and he changed the name to Casa Madeo. Um, and what I think it's so uh, important and unique about uh, Mike and Casa Madeo is that he's been at the front of Casa Madeo since the 1960s. He's been through the worst decades of the Bronx and he's been committed to his community, to his business. He's been providing um, Latino music and instruments uh, since the 1960s. So in 2001, 
Casa Amadeo was listed in, in the National Register for the greatest contributions that uh, Mike has done to the Bronx. And Mike has been featured in the New Yorker, the New York Times, and they always talk about how he, he was able to go through the worst decades of, of, of the Bronx and he's still there, um, you know, getting up early, opening the gates of his business and serving his clients. So I got the chance to interview Mike uh, like two years ago, and I was impressed by how much energy he has. Even though he's he's uh, eighty something years old, he's still very very energetic, and uh, that that was very surprising and admirable about him. So I'm really glad that he he's able to talk to us because uh, you know he's eighty something years old, so it's been a challenge to coordinate all the technical issues. But uh, but yeah. Sí, sí, sí. He's, he's with us now. Por eso va a música ahí, pero ¿qué tal? Le voy a hacer unas cuantas preguntitas. Hi, Mike. Give me one second. Ah, excelente. Aquí está. Este puede... ¿Se puede mirar? Hi, Mike. How are you? Hi, Mike. Can you hear me? Hi, Mike. Can you hear me? I How are you, Mike? How are I'm you, Mike? I'm doing fine. Thanks so much for joining us. It's wonderful to have you with us. The first question that I want to ask you is how are you doing during the pandemic? How's your business and how are you during this time? Well, it was it, at this moment, I'm doing fine. But I, you have to remember that I was closed for three months and that was devastating. I'm not used to that. I'm not used to being away from Casa Madeo for that long, you know. But yeah. uh, ever since I got back, I started liking the store and being here more than ever. Because I know what this store now means to me. This is, this is, to me, this is paradise. Yeah. And I'm going to keep it that way as long as I can. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you will. I, I was just telling uh, all the participants of this call that you've been in the front of Casa Madeo since the 1960s. So that's pretty amazing. And um, I was reading an article from the New York Magazine saying that during the pandemic, you've been selling a lot of instruments. You've been selling a lot of guitars. Guitars. Um, I, why, do you, why do you think people are, are buying more instruments right now? Why are they buying well, more guitars? That's a very easy question to, uh, <laughs> to answer because it's so happened that the same thing is happening to all over. People are willing to, before nobody wanted to buy guitar, they didn't want to spend money on guitar, they didn't want to spend money on a domino table with a domino set and things like that, because, you know, that money they could use for, you know, spending it out in the street and things like that. Now, they are obligated to stay home. <laughs> you know, they have nothing to do. So everybody now wants to be a musician. <laughs> everybody is willing to, to spend the time instead of uh, being out on the street with a mask in their face. They want to be home with a guitar. And it was great for me because that first, uh, as soon as I got back for those three, three months, the store went up in sales like 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 20 years back you know it was wow 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 that's that's amazing it was real uh, good i was selling about three four five times more than yeah. that's, that's wonderful that's great to hear mike also if you guys have questions please feel free to type them on the chat uh, excuse, yeah. excuse me, excuse me just a second, please. Yeah, go ahead. Guys, guys. Yeah, guys, if you have uh, questions, please feel free to ask them oh, on the chat. Um, I didn't yeah, hear Mike. the last one. I was telling people here to keep quiet so that I could hear you. No, don't worry. I was asking people to ask questions. But uh, 
So, and something else that I want to ask you, Mike, is uh, why do you think Casa Madero is so important to the history of the Bronx? Your story uh, has been featured in so many media outlets, the New Yorker, the New York Times. What makes Casa Madero so important to, uh, to the Bronx, to the history of the Bronx? Well, there are two things. The first one is, it was established in 1941 by Victoria Hernandez, Rafael Hernandez's sister. This was 1941 when she left Almacenes and Nande on 130, between 113 and 114th Street and Madison Avenue. She was there since 1929. She left around uh, 1940. She came to the Bronx. And in the same building where she had the apartment in the bottom, you know, right here where I am right now, there was an empty space. So she decided to start Casa Hernandez in the Bronx instead of Almacena Hernandez because she has, she has sold that to uh, somebody that Wait, so happened like that to me in 19, uh, in, in the early 50s when I was beginning, you know, to write songs for the local uh, singers like Carlos Pizarro, uh, Julita Ross, Carmen Delia de Tini, all these people used to come to me for songs and I was only 16, 17 years old. Wow. <laughs> and that's, uh, so Victoria anyway, going back to Victoria, Victoria, when she left Almacene Hernandez at 113th Street in Madison, she came to the Bronx and started Casa Hernandez. So every time that Rafael Hernandez would uh, uh, desire to, to come to New York, she would stay, he would stay right up above the, the store here in her apartment. And everybody used to stop and say hello and things like that. Do you so, live in the building, Mike? She used to live right in the same building, and not you, me. No, no, you don't no. live in the building? No, I don't live in the building. No, I live somewhere else. Right. So, so Victoria, in 1969, decided that it was already, you know, getting. She was tired of it already. Besides that, the, her age, you know, she was uh, up in around the late 80s or early 90s, who knows? So, secret. Yeah. And when I heard that she was uh, trying to, you know, to move out, that's when I spoke to her and she said, you'll be the right person for it because you know a lot about music. Your father was a, a great composer, Alberto Titi Amadeo, my father. Oh, wow. And that's how come I'm in the business, music business because my father was a great composer in the 30s and 40s. He was right, right there with uh, Rafael Hernandez and Pedro Flores and all those big uh, names in the music business. Yeah. And uh, he opened up a lot of doors for me because right. when I started writing songs at the age of 16, I mean, yeah, this that, was... That's what I wanted to ask you about. You've been uh, writing songs, you've been composing songs for famous musicians. How has that, that experience been for you? How, how's the experience of... Um, writing songs for, for musicians. Well, let me tell, tell you. us about that. Oh, that, that was, it's great. For, you know, when they used to call, they used to call me, you know, a, 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 a 16, at the age of 16 years. When I was 16 years old, I was already being asked to write this for me, write this. People like Carlos Pizarro, Singers of the, that era that were beginning, they were maybe five or six years older than me. I was 16, they must have been 21, 26, 30 years old. And they would come to me asking me for, you know, Amadeo, Mike, tiene una canción para mí, do you want me? So, please write me a song. And that helped me a lot. Those were the locals, most of that music stayed in El Barrio mm -hmm. because the, companies for which they were recording were stationed there and they didn't have the connections you know like with now you get connection with Colombia 
Central America, uh, South America, all over. Yeah. And and do, not, do, are you not, still composing? Are you still writing songs? I'm still writing. The thing is, we are short of singers. <laughs> mm. You know, people that are now, you know, before it was the, the, the rapping and the, mm -hmm. <laughs> something that I wasn't accustomed to and that I was not able to, to get involved with. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I, I, I could write a beautiful bolero, but don't ask me to rap for you. Or yeah. anything. <laughs> I, wouldn't do it. I wouldn't be able to do it. But if you ask for a beautiful bolero, if you got a girlfriend and you want me to write something beautiful for her, talk to me and I'll help you. <laughs> so, so Diego, do we have one, uh, one, one last final question for uh, for Mike, as you guys know, obviously we're in the store and he is still running the business. Uh, any yeah. uh, closing question that anyone wants yeah. to ask? Uh, I just have one last question. If Mike uh, could tell us about the uh, main challenges that your business is facing right now, uh, that would be wonderful. What are the main challenges that Casa Madeo is facing right now? Well, the only thing is the, the, the virus, you know, this is, this has, Kill every business, uh, every regular business yeah. uh, in the area is closed. People just, and then another thing, musicians cannot go into a bar or uh, like before, you will go to a regular bar, no, 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 dancing place or anything like that, just to listen to the music and they will have a trio there playing for you. And I was always going to these places and let me tell you, I used to walk in into one of these places right away. The trio that was playing there would start singing my songs. <laughs> so I was very popular in every bar and grill in the Bronx and uh, almost in the state. I could say in the state of New York, everyone I, that I go, everybody would start singing my songs. There are close, close to a thousand recordings of my music. Wow. I, it's not, I haven't, I didn't write. 3,000 uh, thousand songs, maybe I have about 250, but there are songs of mine that have been recorded 10, 15 times. Mm. You got a song that Hector Lavoe did, De Ti Depende, De Ti Depende Dios, a big hit for Hector Lavoe. That song had been recorded by Cheo Feliciano and about 10 other singers before Hector, Hector Lavoe made wow. it a hit. I recorded Idilio in 1954. And you know what? Willie Colon came to me and asked me for a song so that he could record his band, record his band. You know what I gave him? Idilio, the song that I, have, that I had recorded in 1954. I did nothing with it. When I gave it to Willie, he recorded it and it became one of his biggest hits. Idilio, solo me aliente el deseo divino de hacerte uh -huh. mía. Uh -huh. No me destruye la incertidumbre que estoy pasando. Oh, shit. Wow. Remember that? <laughs> of course. Okay, I, I, I was the one that put that in the market. It was written by my father, Alberto Titi Amadeo. And that's why I always said he opened my doors for his son, Miguel Angel, to go on. Because everywhere I went, they will say, oh, tú eres el hijo de Titi Amadeo. You related to Titi Amadeo. So that's my father. Oh, no wonder. So. Well, well thanks so much. God bless you. And Thank you so much. Hi, Mike. Soon. Hi, Mike. Hi. Que Dios los bendiga. Thanks so much. Okay, for, guys. Thank you so much. That's Elena. For your answers, Mike. <laughs> All right, um, so thank you everybody for joining this meeting. Thank you, Angel, thank you, Sam, thank you, Mike, of course. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all in another meeting and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I recorded this meeting, so I'm gonna be sending it to your emails and have a wonderful evening. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good night, everyone. Thanks for seeing the way. Thank you, Angel. <laughs> God bless.